All right, hello everybody. Welcome to another practical primer. Today I want to talk about HTTP and static site generators. Um, so HTTP uh, is a huge concept and it's a huge topic and I'm going to have to oversimplify a lot of things. So if you're more experienced, um, try not to cringe when I make those oversimplifications. But um, I think it'll be beneficial for everyone to realize kind of um, the core of how the internet works and how data gets passed around um, using this thing called HTTP. And then sort of to follow on that topic, I want to talk about static site generators because um, they're a really, really interesting technology that sort of rose to pop, uh, popularity maybe in the last like five years or four years or something. And they're really interesting because they offer a lot of benefits and it is uh, the technology that I want everyone in the group to use uh, or I highly recommend you know, for you to use it for your web portfolio for specific reasons that I'll talk about later. So. Um, let's just get started with HTTP. Now, HTTP describes, um, again, the way that data gets passed around on the internet. Uh, HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and um, I think the best way to learn about it is to just kind of walk through an example of how the data might move around. Um, so, for example, let's say that you open up your browser um, and go to... Oh, I had some things going. Let me just clear out these processes. Yeah. So uh, let's say you go to cheese.com. Now, I found I'm using cheese.com because uh, it's kind of the same simple static site every single time I visit it. So it's not like Facebook, in other words, where things are constantly changing depending on new posts and new you know, status updates and things like that. Cheese.com, um, luckily for us, is sort of like a reference site on cheese. So <laughs> I'm using it as an example here today. Okay, so when I hit enter, I have cheese.com typed into my address bar. When I hit enter, what happens? Um, it's a very intricate story and there's so many pieces to the puzzle. Um, there's something called DNS, there's something called, you know, servers, load balancing, caches, all these things. Um, but I'm going to spoil all of that down and use a simple metaphor. Okay, so let's say you go into your nearest city. So right now, um, let's just pick a city. Um, let's see, where's, where's here? So this is where I work, actually. Um, it's a company called New Lab. And let's just say I walk here. I'm at New Lab, and I walk into the middle of some park I go into this park right here and I shout out to the heavens and I'm like, I want a burger, right? Is that going to get me a burger? Probably not. That's not going to help me. It's not really going to do me any good. Um, and for this example, let's just say I'm new to the city, so I don't really know anything about it. Okay, so if I want to get a burger, how might I do that? Well, I think a good way um, would be to look up a burger place, right? So let's say um, I go to the nearest person sitting on a bench who seems to be a native New Yorker, and I'm like, hey, um, I'm new to the city. I want a burger, but I don't know where to get one. So can you point me in uh, the right direction? And this person on the bench, if they're nice, they'll be like, oh, well, if you're looking for a burger, you should go to uh, Cozy Cafe. Let's just say they, they serve burgers. So I'm here, and I, sit, I ask some guy on the bench, I'm like, hey, where can I get a burger? And this person is like, well, if you want burgers, Cozy Cafe is the place to go. I assure you I'm not affiliated with Cozy Cafe. Um, and so you go to Cozy Cafe and you walk in front of the cash register, uh, you know, the little ordering place, and you're like, hello, I would like a burger. The people there will know how to process that request. The people in the park don't know how to know how to process it because they're not burger people. They don't provide burgers. They're there for a completely different reason. So that is the wrong place to ask. But if you go to this um, this cozy cafe, for example, and you ask for a burger or a scone or something that cafes serve, then they will know how to process it. And sure enough, um, the exchange happens. You give them some money and they'll give you a burger or a coffee or whatever you were looking for. All right. So why did I talk about this obscure, useless example? Well, data on the internet flows in much the same way, right? There is someone in the park, so to speak, who tells you where to look for whatever you're looking for, and then you go to that place, 
ask for what you were looking for, be it a burger or whatever, and then that person will know how to process your request. And then they'll give you what you were looking for, and then you can go home and you can eat the burger and feast in the comfort of your own living room or whatever. So let's go back to this new tab, and we have cheese.com sitting here in our address bar. If I hit enter, a bunch of everything I just said is going to happen at light speed um, on the interwebs, right? So like if I hit enter on this keyboard, um, Chrome will send a request to um, cheese.com. But the problem is, where? What does that mean? Wh when I look for cheese.com, what does that, you know, what does that even actually mean? Well, there are these things called DNS servers, um, which are basically just computers that sit, and they just wait there, and they and they're waiting for people to ask them stuff about where to get burgers and where to get cheese.com and whatever. And as soon as we ask this DNS server, hey. Um, I want to look for cheese.com. This DNS server is kind of like the sage. He's the proverbial guy sitting on the bench in New York. And he's going to be like, all right, well, if you're looking for cheese.com, I know where you should go. And then he's going to tell you some random IP address. So it's going to be some, he's going to tell your computer some number like this, right? Some crazy number. And then even though we can't interpret that, the computer knows exactly how to read IP addresses. And then once it gets that number, it's the same as like a real world address in the same way that if we know Cozy Cafe's um, real world address, we as humans know exactly how to go there. Um, if a computer asks a DNS server where to look for cheese.com, it'll give us, it'll give our computers an IP address and our computers will know exactly where to look. And then so if I type in cheese.com, I hit enter and send the request, then like, you know, at light speed, all these things just happen. So my computer just asked some DNS server where to get cheese.com. The, the DNS server gave me a number. My computer visited that number and it asked it, hey, um, this DNS server told me that you know how to process my request. I'm looking for the cheese.com homepage. Can you help me out? And the cheese.com server, let's just call it the cheese server. So the cheese server was like, yeah, sure. That's like what I do, bro. I can get you cheese.com homepage any time of day. So it gives you the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript that you're looking for, and it just spits it back out at you. And then you can take that data, you can take it home with you, and then open it on your browser, right? So the request goes out from Chrome, from your computer, it hits a DNS server, the DNS server redirects you to where you're actually trying to go. And then once this, uh, you get to that server, you your request is processed you receive some data in return and then that data is displayed in your browser in the form of a web page consisting of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Okay, so that is sort of how it goes for a static website. So if I refresh this page, right, if I refresh cheese.com, um, I'm going to get the same page. Like I'm refreshing it now. Notice nothing is really changing every time I refresh it. This is not the case with something like YouTube or something like Facebook. If I go to Facebook.com right now, which I won't do, but I guess I can go to YouTube, right? So if I go to YouTube right now, um, there's just some random YouTube things for me. It's recommended by YouTube's algorithm or whatever. But if I refresh the page, you know, right now it might be the same thing. So let's just try it. Yeah, no, it's see, it changed. So if I refresh the page, the things that come back to me change with every refresh apparently yeah it, it changed again and so this is not the same as cheese.com it seems that when i refresh the page with youtube there's you know the first couple steps are the same so my computer will go to a dns it'll ask where to get youtube.com's homepage, but then when it hits those youtube servers youtube isn't just like oh well here you go here you go here you go it has to do some thinking first. It says, all right, well, I see that you want the youtube.com homepage. Um, and it looks like, you know, there's been some updates since you last requested youtube.com. So before I give it back to you, let me do some thinking. Let me populate this HTML with results and recommendations that you might want, right? And the same kind of algorithmic thinking um, or algorithmic processing happens with Facebook, with Twitter, with Netflix, uh, with a bunch of other things. 
And it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, personalization. It could just be email. If you type in gmail.com, which again, I won't do for privacy reasons, um, Gmail, the Google servers will be like, oh, you got some new mail. So let me dynamically update the data that I returned to you. So you're not just getting the same stuff every single time you refresh, but you're getting your latest data. You're getting the latest dynamic data, your new emails, your new rec recommendations, whatever it might be, right? And so I just want to point everyone's attention to this sketch diagram that I whipped up. Um, and let's retrace the steps with this diagram. So there's the client. This is a, like a networking term. I didn't just make it up. The client, um, which in our case is either Chrome, Firefox, Safari, or the client might also refer to your actual laptop machine. Um, which is sending out an HTTP request to some server. Um, I omitted the DNS for simplicity purposes because DNS is kind of its own thing. But suffice it to say, some server gets a request from you for some data. And then let's see, once it, this request hits the server, it has to make a choice. It has to, well not it, but the response that it gives back to you depends on whether or not the website is static. And I use the word static a lot, and all it really means is kind of unchanging. Is it, is it the same old, same old? Is it you know not updating with every single refresh? The opposite of the word static would be the word dynamic, right? So yeah, let's see. Is the website static? Is it? With cheese.com, it was. Every single time I refreshed the page, the same HTML, CSS, and JavaScript got returned to me. So in that case, cheese.com is, yes, it's static. So let's trace that. And it looks like, most likely, um, cheese.com just has the, kind of the same static files sitting on the server waiting to be returned. There's no additional processing that needs to happen. So when I request it, the static files um, get sent back to me. And then bam, it's already over. I can view cheese.com in my browser. Pretty painless, pretty simple, pretty fast. Well, now let's retrace it again. Let's say I want to go to YouTube or Netflix or something like that. Um, my HTTP request goes out. It hits the servers for whatever service I'm looking for. Um, it has to go through the same decision tree. Is the website static? Well, it's not a decision tree. It's like a more one decision branch. But yeah, is the website static? Well, Netflix isn't. YouTube isn't. Gmail isn't. So let's let's go here. And what, what, what does this lead to? Um, wow, this is a long arrow. Yeah, so it leads to this box where... It could be anything. It could be WordPress, Laravel, Django, Express, Meteor, um, you know, Angular. There could be so many things in this little box. So I just wrote, etc. But it could be any number of technologies that process your request in some way, dynamically process um, some HTML to be returned back, and then once that HTML is generated, you get static files just back again, right? So like if I go. Um, to YouTube and I look at the source developer view source um, it's still HTML that's being sent back to me you know granted it's really crazy 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 HTML um, and you know for in truth uh, there's a lot more there's like years more things uh, that are going on behind the scenes of course but ultimately what I get back this is still HTML it's still an HTML file right um, well actually in this case Oh, nope, yeah, see, so doc type HTML. Um, this was actually a bad example because it, this probably uses Angular or web components or something, but sure enough, in the most technical way, it is still HTML that's being returned to us. So yeah, so if we go back to um, our sketch file, static files ultimately are what gets returned to us um, no matter what, right? Um, it's a file that gets sent, it's not a video I guess it could be, but a video is kind of its own thing. You know, it's like a streaming kind of live thing. But as far as websites and web applications are concerned, um, you're always getting files back. Okay, so let's take a step back for a second. Just look at this thing in its entirety and think about the term static site generator. What might that term imply? Okay, well, static site generators... Um, kind of offer the happy media. They offer the best of both worlds. If we think about cheese.com, 
and some of the advantages that we have with doing it with only static files so let's say we don't use WordPress we don't use Laravel obviously we're losing a lot of power there but what are we gaining let's let's talk about it real quick well first and foremost is speed um, now maybe cheese.com has weak servers or maybe their servers are really far away so it is it does vary you know of course but um, my page which is just a static page it loads pretty quickly you know it's it uh, there's nothing there's nothing really to it it's just a bunch of text so even this long page it loads in like a split second because it's just a static file um, versus something like you know let's say we open Google Maps this is like an application so now it's fully loaded right it took a little bit longer and it's still lightning fast for what it is um, but it took longer because there was processing to be done so first and foremost static files are faster they have a speed benefit second there's a security benefit right so cheese.com or anything that just gives you static files back um, without processing it first because it's less complicated um, because there's no, less layers, less things being done, it's just inherently more secure. Something like WordPress uh, or something like Laravel, which is a huge code base with, you know, maybe you added some plugins, maybe you forgot to update. There are these little nooks and crannies that hackers can latch onto and they can exploit it. They can add code, maybe they can spoof some things, they can pretend to be someone else, they can uh, sniff the code or, you know, there's a bunch of bad things that people can do when there's that extra layer of processing being done. But by keeping it dead simple, by keeping it to just static files, it's a lot more secure. There's nothing to hack essentially, except maybe the core server itself. Um, obviously using static files is not gonna guarantee that you never get hacked in any way, but it is an order of magnitude more secure, um, just by definition, because there's nothing to hack, right? So there's the speed benefit, the um, security benefit, and then um, lastly, there's just the cost benefit, I think. Having a server that just stupidly, and I say stupidly because there's no processing, stupidly returns files, that's a very simple um, you know, thing to do. And even from like the early servers, like early, early Apache, this is something that they excel at. It's something that they're very good at. They're just very good at, you want a server? I mean, you want a homepage? Here's a homepage. You want a... You want this file? Here's a file. It's very good at spitting files back at you um, versus something like WordPress, which um, requires CPU power because there needs to be processing that's done. Um, and maybe maybe you have a setup for WordPress or Laravel where um, you want to mitigate some of that so you have a cache or something so that you, know, you can return pages faster. Well, the cache itself still costs money. So no matter what, um, it will always cost less to host static files as opposed to some dynamic application somewhere. So speed, security, and cost, right? And so these are not trivial benefits. These are very, very real. And um, I think people notice that. People notice that for a lot of sites, so for cheese.com, for example, let's look at cheese.com real quick again. If we go to cheese.com, there's nothing really changing again. And so would it be overkill to use WordPress to host this? I mean, maybe if you know they're changing around the content, if they're adding new cheeses every single day, then maybe not because WordPress is good at that. And maybe you know that trade-off is worth it to you or to cheese.com. But um, for a lot of other people, it's not worth it, right? So for me, if we go to my portfolio um, and look at this about page or this projects page it's not like I'm creating new projects every single week or anything I create maybe like a baby project every couple months and so I don't need something like WordPress um, constantly running constantly being paid for and I don't want to have to maintain the security of WordPress I don't want to keep it updated and stuff and so people realize that um, while when your use case is simple Something like WordPress may be overkill. And so what's the alternative? So are, what are we going to code? Like if I go to um, my test projects folder, I mean my projects folder, and I create some new tests, so test 222, whatever, and I CD into that, and I open this in Sublime, 
and I create some new file and I call it index.html, am I really supposed to create like a new HTML file for every single page? So if I want an about page, am I supposed to do this? Like what if I have 400 blog posts? Am I really supposed to do like blog post number like 502 or whatever and then just keep doing it this way because this seems really stupid, right? Um, and so no, <laughs> obviously this is a terrible solution and there's a reason why WordPress is used. There's there, WordPress was created and I keep saying WordPress, but these dynamic web application technologies were created as a response to the limitations of these static files. You know, um, if you create a style sheet, like you, you're basically copying and pasting this into every single page, right? And that is, that's garbo. That's a terrible strategy. And it's, um, if I want to change, for example, the title from document, which is the default to like title new, then I have to save it here. I have to go here and I have to save it here. And I have to go in here and save it here. And that's only for three web pages, right? So there are very real limitations to static um, static sites as well. And so static site generators are this wonderfully interesting, to me, medium technology, this medium ground, where for certain people with certain types of use cases, it's extremely perfect and it's, an, it's a great solution that is, um, it's fast, it is secure because it's just static files and it is um, cheap because it's just static files. So let's just talk about what it is, right? So um, first and foremost, um, I think it's good to talk about the Hugo process. So I'm using Hugo. Um, it's just one of many static site generators. Uh, there's this thing called Jekyll out there. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So Jekyll.rb, which stands for Ruby. Uh, this is the most popular static site generator. They have a very pretty little website um, that you can use, and it's extremely powerful. If you go to the docs, um, there's a lot of things you can do. I chose uh, Hugo for you know just personal reasons, and we had to use it at work, and it is really good. It's maybe the third most popular, uh, but I use Hugo, and whether you're using Jekyll or Hugo, there is a terminal component to it. So if I go here and type Hugo, um, oh, actually it's not gonna work because this is not a Hugo project, but if I go to my project and I type Hugo, some things are happening. It says started building sites, building site for language English, and then it just has some facts. And then it says it completed building my site in 197 milliseconds, right? So this is extremely fast, um, but that's kind of beside the point. So if I type this, um, what is it, Hugo version? Yeah, so Hugo Static Site Generator, version 0.20.2, and then some information, I think, about my processor. I forgot what this refers to. Um, I'm tired. But the build date, and then I guess th this is the date that this version of Hugo was built. So what is Hugo doing? Well, let's open up this project in my Sublime Text text editor. Um, and let's look at the kind of the file structure here on the left. There's this content folder. Okay a data folder, a docs folder, um, this node modules folder, which is from MPM or yarn. There's this public folder, which I don't believe I'm actually using. So I can, I think I can delete that, but there's the source, source folder, static folder and themes folder. So um, first I want to start with this themes folder. There's a theme called the flashy rhetoric theme, which is, um, this is my handle. So uh, it's a theme that I made and well, it's a theme folder that I made. And if I go into this layouts folder, you see these like weird default and partials. It's not like I have a partial section on my site, right? If I go to my site here, I don't have a partial section of any kind. So what is this partials folder doing? What's actually going on here? Well, if I go to this posts, um, actually, let's go to this one. If I go to this posts.html file, um, let's just look at this. So it looks kind of like HTML, but then there's this weird piece here. And there's this weird piece here. There's this weird thing that says range where dot site dot pages. Like this syntax is probably very, very unfamiliar to you. Um, and it was to me when I was first learning Hugo. But this is a Hugo feature, right? Well, more accurately, it's a Go feature, but um, it comes as part of the package, right? So it's not HTML is kind of my point. Um, if we go to the posts, uh, 
so this posts.html controls the layout for this page. Uh, it's very, very simple, but there's like, it says building the new lab developer site, right? But if I go here and I do a search for like developer site, that text doesn't actually come up on this page. So what's going on? Well, let me isolate this section. Um, let's isolate this. So if I go back to this page, it looks like this is an unordered list that I made. Um, each of these is a list item containing a link because if I click it, it goes to the post. So it looks like an unordered list with list items containing anchor tags, right? And sure enough, if we look here, it's an unordered list with list items with anchor tags. But it looks like there's something dynamic happening here. Um, range where site pages, uh, where the site pages section is equal to posts. And if not equals the title and the post. So if it's saying the toast, if the title and the posts are not equal, then do this. Okay, so what is going on? Well, let's look at this Hugo process again. If I typed Hugo, it says started building sites, right? If I go to this sketch diagram again, it looks like we're doing what this little box here does before the site ever even gets on the server. So but what I mean by that is when a user requests something like Netflix or YouTube, the request is received, the process um, starts running, right? The WordPress, the Laravel, the Django, whatever it might be. It starts processing data and it starts stitching together this dynamically updated response to return the static files. But and the reason they do it this way is because they need real-time updates. But um, users don't need my updates in real time. They don't need my posts as soon as it's created. And so we we get this little we can do this little cheat where this processing that gets hap that gets done here, um, we can do it before we even upload our files to the server. So right now this server is being hosted. I mean this website of mine is being hosted using GitHub Pages, right? Um, so my site is on GitHub servers, but before I ever even put it there, I built the site on my own computer. I built it here. So if I, I went to, let's see, okay, let's start from a fresh start. I opened up terminal. I went to my projects, no sites. I think it's in my sites folder. And I went to my flashy rhetoric .github .io folder. And here I typed Hugo. And then when I run this, this Hugo process looks at my file blah, 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 folder structure on the left and it intelligently populates this HTML template with data. So where is it pulling this data? Well, it's looking into this content posts folder. And then if you look here, these are all the names of my blog posts. And so Hugo is smart enough to be like, all right, well, um, you can store all your data here. Uh, when you type in Hugo, I will take your templates and then I'll populate it depending on what you put um, using the data that's in here. And if I look at my projects.html file, um, there's a similar thing. It says range, uh, my range just kind of means like get the stuff. So it's like get the stuff um, called projects, get the project stuff and then sort that project stuff by weight. And weight just means like if I go to um, projects, no, 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 data projects and I go to any one project file, then wait just means the order. So if you look here, um, projects, the, oh, this is actually not working. Crap. <laughs> All right, well, so that's broken, I just found out. But yeah, wait normally would make the Adelie developers group item second here. So that's broken and I have to fix that. But in any case, that's what this template does. It just pulls data from some other file, builds it on my computer, and then it spits out static HTML files. So let's go to this project on GitHub. If I go to here, um, and it, by the way, this is a little Chrome extension called, I think, Octotree. It's very helpful. Um, normally, if you want to go exploring a GitHub project, you have to click through, but this just lets you, you know, do like a drop down thing like this. Um, but anyways, when I type Hugo here, um, I, I've configured it behind the scenes so that it builds my site and then spits out a series of static files into this docs folder. So if we look here, let's look into this docs folder. This uh, has an about file, 
no, an about folder, a uh, posts folder, and a projects folder. There's a 404 page, an index.html. There's a folder for my images, for my CSS, and my JavaScript. I don't think I have much JavaScript, but yeah. So it has these things. And so what you see when you go to kevino.me, like the stuff you're seeing right now, this all this code right here, is the contents of this one folder called docs. If I go to about, there's an about index. And sure enough, if I go to about, uh, my name is Kevin O, or a flashy rhetoric, and then there's a, a bunch of little things. If I go to this index.html file, it says, my name is Kevin O. Um, I'm a friend and developer, blah, blah, blah. And so this is kind of revolutionary, right? To me, when I first found out about it, I was fascinated by this technology because it lets you fuse the dynamic aspect of WordPress, Laravel, Django, whatever, with the benefits of static files. When I spit out, when I create Hugo and I run Hugo the process, um, it spits out static files into the stocks folder and you can't, you know, you can't hack this. There's no security, you know, uh, loopholes. No, there's no security things to hack. It is fast It's uh, because it's just a static file. And, you know, I'm literally hosting it for free on GitHub Pages. And, you know, I think GitHub Pages offers this service because it's so cheap for them to host static files. Um, like, they would never let you host WordPress for free because it takes up CPU power and a bunch of other things. But um, hosting static files is literally what they do. And so they realized they could just serve it for free from their servers. Um, and so literally... Serving my website, I don't pay anything. It's it's a really great little service that they offer, and um, yeah, so that's it really. I mean, I want to get I don't want to get too deep into it. I'm I'm trying to focus on conciseness in my videos, but yeah, static site generators give you the best of dynamic web application processing, kind of, um, and they are still limited. Of course, you could never build YouTube with a static site generator, but um they give you that dynamic aspect you don't you no longer have to code um you no longer have to copy and paste you can create something like a template that gets intelligently populated with data from other parts in your project this um posts folder for example right um and there's little tricks there's more nuances to how static site generators work to how hugo works but that's the gist um the power of dynamic applications dynamic processing fused with the speed, the security, and the low cost um, or free cost of static files. And so that's the gist. Um, feel free to, I think there's a static site generator list, like, yeah, staticgen.com, I think. And, oh wait, is this it? Yeah, this is it. So there's a list of every single one. Uh, <laughs> and there's a, like a lot. So you can fr feel free to, you know, dive into this and see what you want to use. But Jekyll is the first most popular. Hugo is the second. Jekyll uses Ruby and something called Liquid Templates. Hugo uses Golang, which is a uh, language by Google, and it uses Go Templates. So what you're seeing here is a Go template. Um, this, this curly bracket syntax is a feature from Go. Um, and Hexo is a JavaScript-based one that uses EJS, uh, which is its own templating language. There's like a there's way too many templating languages, honestly, but um, it uses EJS, which is, I guess, embedded JavaScript, and this is the site for that. And so dive into this, explore it, and, you know, to Jihan, I hope I'm saying your name right, bro. Uh, it's been a long time. I'm sorry if I said it wrong, but Jihan, yeah, I know, um, and some other people were looking on how to organize their project structures. This is the answer if you want to do it um, the way I did it and the way so many other people have done it. So if we look at Jekyll, it's like 30,000 people are using this one, 17,000 people are using Hugo. It's an extremely popular uh, technology. So look into them, uh, check them out, see how you like it. Uh, Hexo, one thing, one quick note, because I wanna save you some time. I looked into Hexo because JavaScript is comfortable to me. And um, obviously that's like, I know it more than Go and I know it more than Ruby. So I checked out Hexo first actually. Um, and when I go to the docs, it's, I don't want to bash Hexo because uh, it's still, obviously, they've, they're have they doing something right. But um, I had some trouble figuring out how to get started with it. So 
maybe you'll have more success than me, but I would recommend giving uh, Hugo a shot. Um, and this is everything from this point forward is my personal commentary, but Hugo compiles much faster than Jekyll. I think if I do Hugo, it'll it compiled it in 85 milliseconds. The latest, it's, the longest it's ever taken was maybe like 150 or something. Um, but Jekyll can take like several seconds. So, you know, it's a much slower thing. Uh, but again, do your own research. Hexo, I think, was hard because the documentation was a little hard to pick up on, especially if you're new to static site generators. Uh, for example, let's see, like, um, the data files. Like, this is it. This is, they don't really tell you much. Sometimes you may need to use data and some templates. Add this value here, and then you could use it here, render it here. But then it doesn't tell you about, like, for on my site, I have projects... I have projects and I have posts and I'm planning to add like um, other stuff too. So there's like different kinds of posts that you want to keep track of. And it's, I, it's, I feel like it's a little hard to do that in Hexo. So just my grain of salt. I really love Hugo. Um, so check that out if you're willing to dive into Go. <sighs> but that's it. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you uh, were, I hope you learned something about the, um, the nature of HTTP, the benefits of, uh, static sites and the benefits of dynamic sites and how static site generators provide a sort of happy medium that will let you get started creating your project, developing without having to violate dry, which is the don't repeat yourself concept, right? So um, yeah, I'll just wrap it up here. Thanks again for listening. Um, the next video will come out whenever. As always, if you have any questions, please address it in the group. And thanks so much for watching. Uh, I'll see you guys in the next one.